For the rest of us, let me encourage you once again to open to the book of Romans. I hope this part of your Bible is getting well worn. Uh, It's taking a little while to move through Romans, but we're in Romans chapter 6. We're looking at verses 15 through to the end of the chapter. Romans 6, uh, verse 15 through the end of the chapter. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for these reminders in song that's really just singing scripture. How great is this love that you've lavished on us that we should be called your children. And Lord, the freedom that is ours in Christ. And and yet, Lord, in that freedom, you invite us to choose to serve you. Lord, would you help us, help us to capture the essence of that truth this morning. Help us, God, to see how that gets lived out in, Father, what it is to live in freedom versus shackled in slavery to sin. God, we just invite you by your spirit. Speak to our hearts. Apply these words of scripture. Change us from the inside. Conform us more and more in the image of Christ. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jack Handy's written a book uh, that's entitled Fuzzy Memories. And in it, he's describing what it was like to live as an elementary school student. And uh, what Jack says is this. Every day in his elementary school experience, he lived with a school bully that demanded his lunch money. The problem for Jack was he was a whole lot smaller than the bully. And so every day he would hand over his lunch money to the bully. And then he decided, I need to do something about this, and he decided, I'm going to fight back. And so he arranged to get some self-defense karate lessons. (laughs) Going to fight back against this bully. The problem was the karate teacher was charging five bucks a lesson. And Jack didn't have five bucks. So he said... I went back and just paid the bully. It was cheaper. (laughs) Can you resonate with that just a little bit? Sometimes it's just easier to just go along with whatever's happening with that bully in your life, whoever or whatever that might be, versus getting free from that. This was Jack's reality. And, you know, I hear similar things when I sit with people in over a number of years now in a pastoral way, listening to stories and and hearing what's being spoken, it just seems like it's just easier to go along with the bully. Now, I want you to know, as I share some of these comments, this is drawn from five different churches over 35 years of ministry and many, many, many people. It's not necessarily people here, but then again, maybe it is, okay? So just know that. So I'm hearing these stories of that uh, doctor, maybe that PA or, uh, you know, others in the medical field, they're they're maybe lecturing someone about the risk of cancer due to smoking and and they're trying to help them turn away from uh, something that they know is damaging in that way. And then what happens on their lunch break? They slip out the side door of the clinic so they can do their smoke break. And, and they just, this is part of what's going on in their life. And, and they feel trapped in those, in those things. And, and then there's that person who says, you know, I, I'm not an alcoholic or I, I'm, not, I'm not addicted to drugs. I can quit any time. But they don't because they can't. Once they indulge in that one drink or they take another hit with that drug of choice, suddenly there's that downward spiral. And once again, they're being accosted by the bully. To hear them tell the story, it just seems less costly to go along with it than to break free. Can you relate to those thoughts, comments, things that get a hold of us? It's interesting because when you read in the scriptures, while the word bully is not used directly concerning the word sin, it is what the Bible is saying. Sin is a bully. It's a cruel taskmaster. And when sin, and you and I are shackled to that sin, it uses us up and kicks us to the curb. Sin has one plan, to, t- to tear down and destroy us, those made in the very image of God, in order to um, push back against God 
and in some way try to undermine that which God is doing. And our enemy is relentless and cruel. He, he seeks to steal, kill, corrupt, destroy. And you and I get caught up in, in being bullied by sin, if you will, and entangled in that sin and indeed find ourselves a slave to sin. And God's word is very clear that this is where we end up. We've been working through the book of Romans. Most recently, we've been in Romans chapter 6. And I just remind you quickly this morning that um, this book of Romans, as you begin those first three chapters, really help us understand why we need a Savior because of the desperate state of hostility and sin in our world and how broken and fallen each and every one of us are. And so the scripture is abundantly true when it says we have no excuse. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and we're sinners by nature, uh, but we're also sinners by choice because we keep getting taken in by sin that dresses up and masquerades as freedom and promising something good. And if you nibble on that, if you bite on that, then there's a hook. And now it's caught you. Romans is systematically teaching us, listen, we need someone to rescue us from that. We need someone to rescue us from this bully called sin, from this one that would enslave us. And that's why God sent Christ. And Christ came that we might be set free, that, that we might, in fact, be uh, released from slavery and, and just enabling us to live and walk in that freedom because he provides a righteousness from heaven, bought and paid for on the cross. And so Christ extends that to each and every one of us. And so it's for freedom, Galatians 5, 1 says, that Christ has set us free. He wants us to live in freedom. I got to check in with you this morning, and I just had to do this in my own self this morning before I even came. Am I living in freedom? Am I living free in Christ? Or am I finding myself entangled in sin and once again, ball and shackle being attached to my ankle. Last weekend, we were looking at <clears throat> Romans 6, verses 5 through 14. <clears throat> Romans 6, 10 says, The death that Christ died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. And, and what Paul begins to do in Romans 6 is he begins to say, now there's freedom that Christ has purchased for us, but here's how you live out that freedom. Here's how you live out this new life that Christ has for you. So you might remember with me last weekend as we wrapped up, we were in verses 11 through 14 in particular, there were like four commands or four imperatives. And so Paul says, here's how we live this out. We need to determine by an act of our will to do this. Number one, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Dead to the things that are sin, but alive and tender hearted towards God and all that he desires of us. That would be verse 11. Verse 12 would, was to say, refuse to let sin reign in your mortal body. R refuse, resist, push back, reject the lies, stand firm against the enemy that would try to shackle us with sin. Resist. The third imperative was to stop offering your body as an instrument for wickedness because remember, we're under new grace and management and ownership because Christ has purchased our life at the cost of his life, his blood. And so we're under Christ in that way, verse 13. And then it went on and said, now offer yourself to God as an instrument of righteousness to do his good and his purposes. Again, verse 13. And so to, to offer yourself in that way to pursue that which is righteous. And then Paul ended by saying, for sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, but rather you're under grace. That's verse 14. That's kind of where we wrapped up last week. The reason I'm repeating it for us right now is because verse 15 and following continues that same line of thought. Continues to build on it. And it's trying to help us to understand how it is that we're to live this new life in Christ. And so as you look with me, what you're going to come away with is, is a picture that says God wants us to use our freedom to live and serve him. Live for him, serve him, versus si serving sin. So you've got this contrast between these two alternative lifestyles. Let's look at verse 15 together. <clears throat> What then? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. <clears throat> 
don't know about you, but when I began to read those words, I'm saying, Lord, how does that connect? That was back in chapter uh, 6 and verse 1. Do you remember that? 6 1? Shall we go on sinning so that grace can increase? And again, Paul's response is, no, never. Let it not be that way. Uh, Paul says, as he presents this gospel that is grace, we're under grace, God's undeserved kindness, he recognizes some people are going to turn that around and use that as an excuse to do stuff they ought not to do. And so there are those who are misinterpreting and saying, well, if we're no longer under the law, which Romans 7 says defines what sin is and tells us what the boundary lines are and what's right and what's wrong. If we're no longer under that law where we're, we're to obey the commands and therefore the law's got a restraining effect on us. If we're not under that law, does that mean that if we're under grace, anything goes? You're, you're, you're free to do anything because you're under grace. Paul realizes some people could twist it that way. And, and Paul's response is, no, grace is not a license to sin. In fact, it's the opposite. Because, in fact, if you're in Christ, you're not wanting to sin, but rather you're wanting to do the things that please God. And so grace is not this license that says, well, I'm just free to do whatever. And, and if people start making that kind of an excuse to say, well, you know, God forgives. He'll forgive. It's okay. I can just do that. He'll forgive me. Friends, if, that, if that's an attitude that you or I might take, do you understand that's presumption on your part and my part? God will forgive me. He'll, he'll just cover it. It's all good, so I'm just going to keep doing it. No, God does not condone sin. Grace is not a license for sin. And so we, we really can't go in that direction. Does anybody remember the name of a guy by the name of Grigory Rasputin? Russian peasant who became a favorite of the leader, the czar of Russia because of something that he was able to do that helped the czar's son. But then he had this unusual uh, ability to influence what was happening at that time. And, and this Russian monk actually taught this kind of an idea that said, well, I can do whatever I want to do because God will forgive. And so therefore, there's more forgiveness. That means there's more grace. And that's a good thing, isn't it? And so I'm just going to keep doing what I want to do. See how twisted that gets? You might say, well, pastor, that's a great historic example. I want to say, yeah, but I hear people today using the same thing, saying, well, I'm under the blood. I'm covered. And because I'm covered, I'm good. And I'm just going to do what I feel like doing. I hear this in the church. Christ followers saying, I can just do whatever. Christ did not set you free to do whatever, to indulge your sinful nature. He set you free, as was read for us in our call to worship, to serve him by serving others in love. He set us free to serve the purposes of God, the righteousness of God, not sin. And so grace is not this license to sin. And, and so Paul responds, may it, may it never be. And, and you go down to verse 16 now, though, and he says, listen, you need to understand. Don't you know? He says, are you ignorant to this? Do you just not get it? Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone to obey him as slaves, you're slave to the one that you obey? You've, you've allowed yourself to become enslaved. In other words, everyone is a slave to something. That's what Paul's saying. Everyone's a slave to something. And you can tell <clears throat> that you become a slave by your forced obedience, the things that you feel like you just have to do and you can't not do. And now you've become enslaved by that. Again, the scripture says that the one who acts um, in obedience to sin, you become a slave to this one in whom you obey. So just think back with me again. You cave into peer pressure you take that first drink, you use drugs for the first time, but it doesn't stop there. there. There's another thing, and there's another thing, and soon it leads one thing to another, and suddenly now it's a habit, and it's, and it's an addictive habit, and, it, and it's deeply rooted in us. It started with a choice. It started with a, a willingness to go there, and then from there it becomes deeper and deeper, and it becomes actually physiological because... There's a, a physiological tie where your body craves those things. And, and so you're battling that and it's in your mind and, 
And now it's an addictive pattern and it's a harmful, destructive pattern and it's just there. Is that not, is that freedom? Or is that slavery? Well, if I have to do it, it's slavery. Everyone's a slave to something and someone. And so Paul just lays this principle out. Think with me again, something that's a great battle in our culture today, uh, especially with online, is this whole thing about pornography. And, and it starts with something so small, a quick glance, adult magazine, X-rated movie, something like that. But then suddenly it gets rooted in, and now they're searching for more images and more stuff and, and going online and pursuing that. And, and yet it's feeling so empty at the end of it. And then repeat the cycle and repeat the cycle. And there's slavery there, not freedom. And it just sucks us in. Or that person who's trapped in gambling and, hey, it was fun at first and I was just trying to, you know, make, make a little bit. And, and, uh, then, but then suddenly you're, you're engaged in it and you're no longer just about beating the house, but I'm, I'm spending money that was meant for food or rent for my family and those things and I just want one more big win and suddenly there's an addictive behavior and it's slavery, it's there. We live in a generation where we could, we could say that the use of our uh, electronics, you know, this stuff right here, has it got you enslaved? <coughs> Go sit in a restaurant and see how many people are using these instead of talking to each other. Or gaming on this. And maybe not this, but maybe it's a PlayStation, maybe, maybe it's um, a computer or whatever, and, and it, it becomes addictive, doesn't it? Where I'm just, I'm doing the game and I, I kind of escape from everything and I'm in this other world and I don't have to deal with stuff. And, but then it kind of consumes you and now it takes your time and your energy and it pulls you in and, and suddenly you're not being responsible and you're not doing the things you would normally do and, and suddenly your parents or your, your family or whatever are getting cut off and, and gaming suddenly becomes this huge anchor in your life that's dragging you down. Friends, Everyone's a slave to something. And God's word is telling us that, reminding us about that. And you don't want to become friends with something that's not looking out for your best interest, but rather is trying to destroy you. I mean, that's like becoming a, a friend with a pet boa constrictor. I mean, they're kind of cute when they're 12 inches long and they wrap around your arm. But if you keep feeding them, they grow. If you keep feeding the addiction, the sin, they grow. And, and what happens is you could have what happened to you, exactly what happened to a 15-year-old named Derek, who's 11 and a half foot, 85-pound Burmese python, did what pythons do and constricted him to death. What a tragic ending. But that was his pet. Well, don't make pets of something that's out there to do something bad to you. Don't be a friend with sin that's there to do something bad to you. Don't be enslaved. Now, if you're a slave to something, what Paul's saying is, listen, if you're going to be a slave, then choose your master and choose wisely. And why would you choose sin, right? Right? Because if you're a slave to sin, the scripture says it results in death. Verse 23 is the well-known verse, right? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the wages of sin are what? Death. Always. Sin kills us. We just don't believe it at the time. We just fool ourselves to think, oh, this won't hurt. This, this won't do something bad. No, it does. And so there's death that comes through sin. There's, there's a <clears throat> separation from God, that's spiritual death, deadening of our soul. But, but there's emotional death too where we're hardened toward the things of God. And, and we pull away from God and we're resistant and rebellious and we want to go the opposite direction. There's, there's relational death where the, things come into our life and suddenly there's barriers and um, wedges that are driven between ourselves and our spouse or our family or friends and, and there's relational things that take place. There's physical death if we don't repent and turn from it and come to Christ and ask for that forgiveness. If, if we don't go there, then ultimately there is physical death and ultimately there is eternal death. <clears throat> 
eternal separation. And friends, that, that place of eternal separation means you're forever separated from God and from people. Hell is not a party, and there's nobody there partying with you. You're alone, in the dark, without God, experiencing incredible torment of the sum total of what it is we brought on ourselves. God doesn't want that for us. He didn't design us for that future. But he says, choose your master and choose well. Because on the one side, wages of sin are death, but verse 23 says the gift of God is what? Eternal life in Christ. And so God says, this is what I want for you. I want you to have life and righteousness. And righteousness means you'll live a life where you're making right choices and, and there's a right attitude and you've got right thinking and right morals and you've got a right standing before God and you're fully accepted. God says, I want this for you so much. I'm willing to give my son that you can experience this, that you can be reunited with me. Paul's building on this foundation. And by the way, a little side note here. This is Jesus' teaching, is it not? Matthew chapter 6. No one can what? Serve two masters. Because this happens. Either you hate one and love the other, Jesus said, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve two masters It's impossible to please God while serving sin. You can't have your feet in two separate camps at the same time. But we pretend we can. We think we can have it both ways, but it just doesn't work out. And God says, you make a choice whom you will serve. Do you want to serve sin? This is where it goes. Or will you choose God? There's no fence sitting. There's no neutral ground. And so God's word here is inviting us to make a good choice. I want you to notice with me, Paul is celebrating that in this church in Rome, he says this, thanks be to God, you used to be slaves to sin, but, but you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching which has been entrusted to you. You started over here in sin, you heard the good news, you responded, and as you responded with faith, repentance, confession, those that you responded. Now you have this new life in Christ. You started over here, but now you're over here. And you've chosen well. You've, you've left a life of sexual sin and debauchery that comes with idol worship, the stealing, the greed, the drunkenness, all that other stuff in the, in the world. You've gone with Christ. Paul says, I'm, I'm celebrating that because Christ has washed you clean. He set you apart. He's declared you not guilty. There are all these things that have taken place. If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. Paul says, I'm celebrating that you made a good choice. But he says, don't stop there. Keep making good choices. Keep serving the one who saved you. Notice, you determined to be obedient to this it says this, the form of the teaching. In other words, everything that Jesus said and commanded, Matthew 28, were to instruct others to take that in. That's what it is to be a, a Christ follower, a disciple. Whatever Jesus said, I want to do. However he lived, I want to live. I want to walk in his footsteps. And so God here reminds us that this teaching has been passed on. And Paul has said, your, your church leaders have done well, passed it on. 2 Thessalonians 2.15, stand firm and hold to the teachings uh, that we've passed on to you. And so Paul says, okay, you had a great start. Now keep living up to that which you've attained. You are free. Now be free. So you've been set free from sin, verse 18. You've become slaves of righteousness. That is, you're choosing to be a slave to God. You're choosing to serve him. This is the paradox of the Christian life. Freed from slavery to sin, free to become a slave for God. And it's one or the other. Those are the only two options. And God's inviting us to continue to make that good choice, knowing that our Heavenly Father loves us and has our best interest in mind and indeed wants us to pursue righteousness for his name's sake, to live for the praise of his glory. Is that not how Jesus lived? The very Son of God who came, Philippians 2 reminds us, became nothing, took on appearance as a man, fully human, took on the very nature of what? The servant. 
Isaiah 53, we just celebrated that. We spent time in Easter season looking at the, this incredible picture in the Old Testament of the one who would come, the suffering what? Servant, slave. The son of God serving as the slave of God for the purpose of drawing you and I to faith in Christ, new life in Christ, forgiveness, eternal life, all those things so that you and I might live. And God says, as Jesus walked, I invite you to walk in the same way. A slave for God. The great paradox. Paul, in numbers of places, but Titus chapter 1 and verse 1, here's how he writes his letter. Paul, a bond slave, a servant of God, an apostle of Christ Jesus, for the faith of God's elect, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. You know, we fought a civil war in this country over slavery. It's back there in history. There's some other kind of civil war stuff happening right now in our culture about those kinds of things. But have you noticed? Not very many people would look at slavery as a good thing. But I want you to notice that the scripture sets sets it apart. It's kind of black and white and says, yeah, over here, this is bad. The slavery to sin is the worst. But a slave for God leads to what? righteousness this is something good and God wants us to choose by an act of our will to choose to serve him let's look at grace in plain language verse 19 Paul says this he's offering a soft apology to his audience because of the weakness of your human nature I'm using this illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Now, why is Paul making an apology at this point? Can I suggest it's for this reason? In the city of Rome, they estimate anything from 85 to 90 plus percent of all the people living in the city of Rome at that time were either slaves or had been slaves. Think with me about the impact of Paul's words, the language the Holy Spirit is using in testifying to what God is looking for. In a culture that is saturated with slavery, many of those in the church would have been either still enslaved or had been enslaved. And indeed, some of them had gone through this journey of having a debt they could not pay and selling themselves into slavery in order to satisfy the debt. And so they remain in slavery for an extended period of time. Not just themselves, but their wife and their kids as well. Do you think that the people in Rome understood what it was like to stand on an auction block in a slave market and be sold? And do you think they might understand a little bit about cruel masters because very few of them were good masters? Paul's using language they can relate to and understand. Because slavery was so much a part of that world. And he says, listen, God wants you to pursue him in such a way that your love for him, because of his kindness and love for you in Christ, your love for him says, I'm willing to voluntarily be a slave for Christ. To serve God in that way. And remember, the Apostle Paul, is he not a free citizen of Rome? And yet here he is saying, the bond servant, the slave of Christ. Everybody's a slave to something. Choose well. Choose God. Because that represents life. Don't don't be a mercenary for sin. Look at verse 19. You used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness. That language is the same as that which is used in verse uh, 13, offering the parts of your body for sin. What you may not realize is that is military language. Offering yourself. It's not religious sacrificial language. It's actually military language, and it works like this. I'm offering my sword to you for a price. In other words, you can pay me to be your mercenary. I will fight for your side. Paul's saying, listen, don't be a slave to sin. Don't act like a mercenary for Satan and pursuing the things of sin, but rather fight for God and be on the side of righteousness. Paul says, when you went that way, you were representing that which is wicked and that which is tearing this world apart and that which Christ died to put an end to. He says, listen, verse 20, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. And so you just went everywhere with that and did all kinds of stuff. 
And if you want to understand what idolatry looks like, do a little research on that. It wasn't just make a simple sacrifice over here and burn something and, and give uh, obedience to a uh, stone or wood idol, but there was incredible debauchery and sexual immorality and all kinds of stuff over here that is just wicked, wicked. And Paul says, you were free from, yeah, you were free from righteousness and all this stuff happened in your life when you were enslaved by that sin. But you've been set free. And you're free in Christ. And so use your freedom, verse 19, in slavery to righteousness because it leads to what? Holiness. If you will serve God and give your life to Christ in that way as a thank offering back to him to say thank you for that which you've done for me, then you can use your freedom to serve Christ, to serve the Heavenly Father. And indeed, you're walking the footsteps of Jesus. Just think back with me, John 13. It says there that Jesus showed what? The full extent of his love. And what did he proceed to do? Wash the feet of the disciples. That which the lowest slave was tasked with. Christ willingly, freely served the Father by serving his disciples in that way. And Christ extends to you and I that same opportunity to say, as Jesus served the Father in that way, walk in his footsteps. In the Old Testament, Psalm 116, verse 16, the psalmist is responding to God's kindness to him. He says, oh, Lord, truly, I'm your servant. I'm your servant, your faithful son. You freed me from my chains. In Exodus 21, in verse 6, there's actually an instruction given that... um, If a servant declares, I love my master, and my wife and children, we don't want to go free. The master's extending freedom. He says, we don't want to go free. Then then what the scripture says was then he's to go to his master and express that love, and, and the master then takes him in front of the city gate, and the elders there listen, and they hear this testimony that says, yeah, I want I want to serve the master. I love my master. He's so kind and generous to me. We just want to serve him with our life. And so the master brings him there, and when that's heard, then they take him to the doorpost, and they take a sharpened awl, and they pierce his ear. And for the rest of his life, for the rest of his life, he serves his master voluntarily, freely, for the rest of his life. Friends, that's the picture of what it is to choose to serve God and pursue his righteousness. And Romans is painting that picture for us here beautifully. Here's the obvious question. Have you had your ear pierced? As in, are you committed to serving God with your whole life and pursuing that righteousness to to live the way Jesus did? Paul says, listen, I want you to understand there are benefits to this. And I want, notice with me, he points it out, verse 21 and following. What was the benefit when you did those other things that you're now ashamed of? How did that work? Terrible. Right? Ashamed of that sin. Ashamed of those things. For some of us, there's memories that when we start reading scripture like this, we have some things that begin, video starts playing in our mind. Things, we hear things and we're reminded, oh boy, I I went there. How did that go? Not well. Was it a profit to you? Was it a good thing? No, it was horrible. Well, what's happened since you've come to Christ? If you're willing to be in Christ, verse 22, you've been free from that. You are free. It's covered. God is forgiven. It's it's not remembered anymore over here. But he's freed you to do what? To live for him. To be a servant for God. To to run into holiness, and the result then is is eternal life. This is the first time in Romans that the word sanctification appears right here. Verse 22. To be sanctified means to be set apart unto God, to become holier and holier and holier as God forms Christ in us. Progressive sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus. And the benefit of serving God is as you lay your life down in service to others and serving the Lord, God teaches you about holiness, trains you in godliness, forms Christ in you, 
and ultimately you have the joy of standing at heaven's gate and being welcomed by the Lord fully, completely as a child of God. Wow. The wages of sin are death, verse 23, but the gift of God eternal life, a life that begins now, not just when we die, now, serving him instead of serving sin. Friends, we have this question that's asked of us, who will you serve? In Isaiah 61, it says in the scriptures, Jesus took the scroll of Isaiah, opened to that part, and talked about the fact that The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me and he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to to bind up and bring healing to the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners. Friends, his mission is our mission. God's inviting us to walk in that as we serve God rather than sin. God says, "Don't, don't go this direction. You know where it leads. Choose. Dead to sin, but what? Alive to God in Christ. Living fully for him. I'm going to invite our worship team to come. We're going to close with a a final song together. But my hope and my prayer this morning is that you can say with integrity, I am a child of God. I've, I've placed my trust fully in Christ. I've received him. I've accepted his sacrifice. If, if you're still on that journey, you're not there yet, that's okay. It, it's this opportunity to say, Lord, Right now, you may well be getting tapped on the shoulder and saying, do you believe that I loved you so much I gave you my son? Do you believe that Christ died in your place? Do you believe that he rose again, that he sits at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe that he is the Savior and there is no other? There was a conversation in, uh, I don't remember if it was Sunday school class this morning or where that all was, but... Uh, we had some kids out on the, uh, out on the uh, entryway over here, standing on the railing, waving at cars as they went by after gym night on Friday night. It was a lot of fun. The kids were having a lot of fun with that. But apparently somebody stopped by and rolled down their windows and just said, Jesus isn't real. <laughs> oh, I'm so grateful that someone from our church had the heart that says, would you like to come and talk about that? Good, good response, right? Um, by the way, a couple of our kids kind of stuck out their tongue in them. <laughs> We're still working on it, right? Still working on those things. But, but here's what matters, right? Christ is not only real. Christ is king. He's Lord. He's Savior. There is no other. And he invites you to experience the freedom that can only come through him, free from sin, dead to sin, now alive to God, and living a new life in Christ, a life like no other. So that when you and I arrive at heaven's gates, Jesus is there with open arms saying, welcome, welcome, child of God. Would you worship with me? as we celebrate the one who sets us free.